Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. Well, we are well into some requests this month. It's been a bit of a while since we sat down and just did, did a good, fun, goofy, dumb horror movie, right? <laughs> yeah. So going through the list, I could see no better title than Seed People. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Seed People. It was recommended by Mikey. So thank you, Mikey, for this. Uh, Seed People is a Charles Band production from 1992. And uh, as a Charles Band production, I don't know. I mean, we've done some Charles Band films before. This guy has a studio called Full Moon Productions, and uh, he has produced over 300 movies. He's directed almost 70 of them, and uh, they're responsible for such classics as Doll Man and Puppet Master, Evil Bong, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, <laughs> <laughs> The Ginger Dead Man. I mean, it's it's mostly straight-to-video schlock is generally what it is. There's some good things in there, just depending on the movie, depending on the script, and depending on the director, as it always is. So uh, this film, Seed People is a straight-off rip-off of um, Invasion of the Mars, Body Snatchers. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, thank you. Just just any of these films where some alien, literal alien meteor, meteorite <laughs> crashes to Earth and uh, starts to infect people, and you don't know who's a seed person and who's not. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, so scary. So this is, uh, this is the movie. This is basically what it is. Uh, I'd never seen it before, never heard of it before. Uh, but thank you, Mikey, for recommending it. How about you, Craig? Is there any chance you'd run across this thing in your life? No. <laughs> no, I, I had never heard of it. You know, I've uh, Charles Band stuff, it has a reputation for not being the highest quality uh, cinema. But like you said, every once in a while, there's something fun. I mean, there are at least... Uh, kind of fun to sit through and giggle at. Um, and that's what I was looking forward to here. I thought, okay, you know, it's it's going to be goofy. It's going to be silly practical effects. And I was down for that. Uh, when it was over, I found myself thinking, gosh, if you're going to be this bad, like, at least be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> it wasn't Wait. even funny. Like, there were a couple of funny parts where I laughed out loud, but for the most part, it took itself really seriously. I'm like, how yeah. can you take yourself this seriously? This is not good stuff. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay, you know, seed people, whatever. <laughs> He's kind of like a low-rent Roger Corman in a way, and the scripts usually are... I don't know, they're often kind of like this. Like you said, it's a silly concept, and they take it too seriously. And so the acting quality is actually passable, I think, for most of the movie. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not It's not laugh-out-loud funny uh, in most parts uh, for the acting-wise. Um, the script, <laughs> you know what I was thinking when I was watching this movie, especially by the end, I thought, because I'm, tr- I'm going back and I'm trying to think, why is this movie so bad? It shouldn't be this bad. And it wasn't like I wanted to turn it off, but I kind of did. It was just blah. And I it, and I went back and I thought about it like the script. If you had taken this script, maybe, and you had just put it in the hands of a completely different team, it might have actually been a pretty good movie. It almost had all of the elements... Uh, even kind of cliche. You got the new guy in town or who's returning to small town. Uh, Meteorite is there. Uh, People are getting possessed. There's a girl running around who kind of discovers it before anybody else. Then it turns out there's the kooky, crazy, wacky, but super smart guy in town who nobody takes seriously but really knows exactly what's going on. You get the sheriff involved. I mean, there are just all these elements that could have worked. They wouldn't have been particularly original, no. but it would have made a better movie, I think, if it just didn't yeah. all feel so low rent, you know, every bit of it. It did, and we were, okay, so we were supposed to record this podcast yesterday, but I couldn't sleep the night before, and so I was dog tired, and I begged Todd to put it off for a day. So <laughs> that means that uh, I watched this the day before yesterday and I barely remember anything about it like that's <laughs> how impactful it was for me like yeah. <laughs> I don't know some like bushes roll around and jump on people 
<laughs> that's that's I mean that's there's a guy who's kind of like a knockoff of Doc from Back to the Future and he's goofy like that's that's about it. I I <laughs> So thanks for listening. All right. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs> no, I I don't know. Like I just don't know much uh what to say about it. So yeah. maybe we should just jump in and see where it goes. Oh god. There are a lot of characters in this movie too. Uh, it's... Too many. Mm. Too and all of the guys look the same. Like I couldn't yeah. tell I, except for the main guy who looks like okay, so the main guy's name is Tom. Um, and he's a geologist because that matters apparently. And uh, when the movie opens up, he's strapped into a hospital bed with a head injury. Like a doctor is talking to him, and then an FBI guy comes in and talks to him. And he's like, "Oh, don't worry, everything's fine. I just need to get your story so we know what's going on. So uh, tell us your story." And so then that's what the whole movie is. It's this guy narrating this story in a super obnoxious fashion, like. Yes. <laughs> really annoying voiceover narration throughout the whole movie. Like, uh, it just drove me crazy. Like, you'd mm. be watching the movie, and here he's, like, you know, walking up to a building or something, and then I decided I need to go over to so-and-so's house. Like, we're watching <laughs> you do it. You don't need to tell us what's, like, <laughs> we have eyeballs. <laughs> but he's telling this whole story, and, and he talks about how he's going back to his hometown of... Uh, Comet Valley, because you got to, you know, get right on the nose right there. Comet Valley, the whole town is going to be closed for three days because there's only one way in and one way out in this one bridge, and uh, they're going to be working on the bridge for three days, so nobody can go anywhere. And he's going to be staying at his ex-girlfriend's parents' bed and breakfast and her name is Heidi and the first thing that bothered me was this guy Tom looks like he's got to be at least in his 40s and this girl who's supposed to be his ex looks like she should be his daughter like in what other (laughs) lifetime did they have a relationship because gross Mm. (laughs) (laughs) maybe what it was like 10 years ago I thought was she 12 or 16 10 years ago (laughs) yeah And he was, like, in his mid-30s? Ew. (laughs) Yeah. And and then she's got, like, I I don't know what, like, her sister died or something, and so now she's helping to raise her niece, who looks to be, like, the exact same age as her. But this, the actor who plays her niece, uh, that the niece's name is Kim, and, and the girl who plays her's name is Holly Fields. Not that it matters, because I've never heard of any of these actors before. But this girl looks like she's the same age as her aunt, but they're dressing her in clothes that are ridiculously too young for her. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like they took this twenty, yeah, they took this twenty-something-year-old woman and put her in like pigtail braids and jumpers, and they're like, "Oh, she's twelve. No, <laughs> <laughs> she's like, she's like an '80s Dorothy Gale." Is but basically what she looks yeah. like. <laughs> <The whole movie. laughs> <laughs> and she kind of acts like it too. Yeah, the whole setup is kind of silly. I-, I will say that the script is smart in that it's the person who wrote it has seen a lot of movies, and they do get to the point pretty quickly, and they are pretty economical about getting all this information across, even though it's mostly just said through, oftentimes a little cheesy dialogue. Like you can tell, they just needed an excuse to work in the backstory of each of these characters. I, I love it when he goes in. Uh, and he's staying at his ex-girlfriend's place. Apparently it was okay enough to book. But when he goes in, she's kind of standoffish to him for no really good reason. Very nice. The place looks good. You've changed the place a lot. Huh? But you haven't changed. Is that supposed to be a compliment? You missed by a mile. Well, it is. And you look great. I'm not the complacent little butterfly I was when you and I were an item. Complacent? When Sally died, I not only lost my sister-in-law, I lost my best friend. Yeah, I know. It must have been hard. Yeah, it still is. And I'm the designated mother for Kim now. She's going through a difficult age, and I just take it one day at a time. So what's it like changing your home into a bed and breakfast? 
What's it like being divorced but still living with your ex-wife? Like the acting is just so bad that <laughs> everything is just a little flat. Mm -hmm. So you don't really believe it. You feel like you're watching a movie. So all these relationships, like you said, the, the age of the actors immediately comes to mind. Some of the stilted dialogue and the way it's delivered, just it doesn't really pull you in to the story. You know you're watching a movie. And then the whole premise that and this is maybe my biggest beef with it this whole premise there you've got this town called comet valley there's one bridge in and out of this town okay i'm trying to imagine that scenario right like it's on like a floating island or something like. yeah <laughs> but it's clearly not and this little rinky dink bridge is definitely not anything that would be an entrance or an exit to a town where that was so critical and so crucial and correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't people driving across it the whole time, even though they're supposed to be working on it? Yeah, I don't know. And then he's being called back into this town by an old friend whose name is Thurman. He's being called back to give a speech on meteorites. So he's presumably come in, I don't know, from big city New York or something to this tiny town, all expenses paid to speak about meteorites, when he ends up giving this speech, it's like to 12 people. Yeah. In what looks like a little room in the like community a, a center. a high school gymnasium. I, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> oh, no, not a, not a gymnasium. It's like a classroom. <laughs> yeah. It, and just everything about this movie is so small, you know? Like, there's no ambition here. And he doesn't say anything that I couldn't say after looking in, like, a third grade geography book or yeah. not geography <laughs> geology book he's like when rocks fall out of the sky they're called meteors but <laughs> when little pieces break off and land they're called meteorites that is his whole lecture <laughs> like, <laughs> and maybe there are some here <laughs> Well, to be fair, he does work in the history of the town, and that's where we get, that's the whole purpose for this scene, right, is for us to know that there's a reason this place is called Comet Valley, and that is there's, I don't know if it was an old legend or something that's just passed down by the generations, or if they just infer a whole hell of a lot from some abstract cave drawings in a cave that's there. Yeah, and, and there are these hieroglyphics that look like they were drawn in crayon in this yes. cave the size of a shoebox <laughs> right, that anybody right. can just walk right in and out of. Like <laughs> Yes. It's, it's just... not it's not even like it's not even like they're discovering these hieroglyphics. Like they're there and everybody knows it. Well, they're just going to check them out again. The, yeah. <laughs> just take a look. It's part of the circuit. You know, I know what this is like. You go back to a small town. There's not a lot to do. You know, you hit up the pizza place you always hit up. You go to the park and, you know, to that hill that you always play ball on and sit and have a picnic. You've got a circuit of things you got to do before you get down to whatever your business is that you're there for, right? And you see people or whatever. So I get it. I guess that's what they're doing. And like you and I are saying, everything is just so small. It's like an ambitious script with a very low production quality and nobody really cares well it's just that whole indian cave drawing thing just kills me in my small town we have native american like rock etchings and stuff and i've seen them but it's not like i have to revisit them every few months to remember <laughs> what they look like like <laughs> they're there i know it it's okay anyway whatever and then they try to establish conflict in just dumb ways like kim the young girl who's not really is convinced that the maid at the bed and breakfast, Mrs. Santiago, is is acting strangely, and she's like, she can read my mind, I'll prove it. And, like, somehow later she's going to prove that this lady can read her mind by videotaping her? I don't under... Yeah, she just runs around and videotapes stuff, which is just an excuse to get... Bad video footage. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so that's her quirk, right? Right. And then there's Ed who's a farmer who's mad because people are out in the middle of the night what he thinks like looking for meteorites in his orchard or whatever which it turns out is true that's precisely what they're doing 
but mm -hmm. for bad reasons. And there's there's Brad, who's a deputy sheriff, who's like interested in Heidi. See, way too many people. I don't care about any of them. I can't keep track of who they are. So yeah. forgive me as we go through this when I'm calling people the wrong names, because I, I didn't know who was... Well and then there's a guy named Frank, right, who's over at the bed and breakfast eating with them, and he's the father? Well, that's, that's, that's Kim's dad, right. Kim's dad, right. I've been trying to get to this part because it's my favorite part of the whole movie. <laughs> well, I know what you're going to say. I know exactly what you're going to start talking about. <laughs> we could just make the whole podcast about this scene, by the way. And, we and then could. End it, I think. Let's do. <laughs> <laughs> so... So he's a farmer, he's her dad, um, and apparently, I guess, like, what they farm in this town is apples, because everybody's always out in these orchards. And so he goes out to, like, check his orchards or whatever, and he turns on the irrigation thing, and then he walks into kind of this little kind of clearing, and there's this one tree that's got something weird on it. Now, the the quality of the video that I was watching was so poor that I really couldn't even tell, like... I guess what they were like alien flowers or something yeah, like, like growing hairy, on this hairy tree pods or something. Yeah, maybe what you could say. Yeah, hairy <laughs> pods and and like he pokes the middle of one and it starts to like ooze a little bit and then it just comes all over his face. <laughs> like... <laughs> right. I felt dirty watching this. <laughs> Thick white slimy spooge <laughs> all over his body. It doesn't stop. I and, mean... I, and I was like, I feel like I've seen this movie before. <laughs> um, and I, I, I think I have, maybe. You probably... But anyway... <laughs> you, you probably on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, <sighs> it's a lot of it. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> More than... More than humanly or alienly possible, one would think. Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll send you some links. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, any, but so anyway, so then like he's like on the ground, drowning in stuff, and uh, I, I guess it kind of like it dissolves him, and like an alien comes out, mm. and these aliens are like coconuts with arms. And yeah. scary mouths, and they walk. They don't have any legs, so they walk on their arms. And like the phone in his truck starts ringing, so like the little coconut with arms like starts waddling over to the truck. The person on the other line is like, "Hello," and all of a sudden it's Frank again. So basically, what's going on here is these people get. It, it's it's difficult to say because in this mm. instance, it's like his body gets decomposed and comes back as something else, but he can still turn into his human form. Mm. But then later in the movie, it seems like under certain circumstances, they can just be cured. So yeah. I don't really know how that works. It's just silly. <laughs> they want, you know, they wanted to have a nice, cool special effect with these aliens, but then they also wanted to create the situation where... They didn't have to have too many special effects. <laughs> so it's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where then these aliens can just... We don't see them really... Well, maybe once we see them transform, don't we? Yeah. But generally, they just uh, suddenly are people again, and they walk around. And then from here on out, the movie becomes pretty slow, because there's just a bunch of investigation going on. Yeah. And what spurs it all is somebody gets killed. It's Thurman that gets killed. First, Kim, like, plays a little cat and mouse game with Mrs. Santiago where she's, like, trying to videotape her, um, but she's not really getting anything. And then, like, her huge video camera, like, malfunctions for a second or something. And while she's messing with that, apparently Mrs. Santiago turns into her seed person thing and, like, rolls at her. Mm. <laughs> it's so weird. like I read that the way that they did this they because they roll like critters like yeah. uh, there's no better way to describe it that's exactly what they look like except bigger they roll mm -hmm. around like the critters do and um the way they did it was they just like covered balls in 
some kind of material and then strung them along behind remote control cars. And it pretty much looks like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look good at all. Yeah. Uh, There's some behind the scenes footage. I mean, they're really proud of, of this. I guess if you rented a full moon video or you bought one, at the end of every one, they have a behind the scenes stuff and previews of other attractions that they offer. I watched a, a whole 25 minute deal on this movie, believe it or not, that was up on YouTube that taught, that showed you all the special effects and everything that was going on in the background. And honestly, it looked like a pretty good time. I mean, everybody was definitely having a ball making the movie, was very proud of what they were doing and the special effects from the behind the scenes footage look kind of cool and professional, but on the screen itself, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. they're lacking. But for a low-budget 80s movie, we've seen much worse. Oh, definitely. Creature effects and things like that. So actually, it's I, I put it middle of the road. Yeah, I, I suppose that you could also say that it's kind of a throwback to these monster movies of the 50s. And if that's what they were going for, I get it. You know, I, I, I see it there. It just doesn't... It seemed like if you are going to do a throwback to this kind of cheesy movie from the 50s or whatever, that you might be a little bit more tongue-in-cheek about it. But yeah, whatever. You were talking about how Thurman gets killed. Okay, so Thurman and, like, a farmer or something, I don't remember who it was, they're out, like, looking around, and they find the weird tree too and it's my favorite line ed the farmer i think it's ed i don't know whatever some farmer says what in the ding dong heck of a doodle hell is that yeah and that was worth watching the whole movie <laughs> yes seriously i'm done that i mean that's it that's I, i've just been waiting to say that take it take it away <laughs> uh, a after his exclamation they blow corn pops at him yeah uh, this pit pot so it doesn't just you know splooge it also spits so it doesn't even have an internal consistency or logic <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, these end up all over his body and he just kind of falls down and thurman runs away at the same time we've got this crazy guy doc he is strung up with fluorescent tubes half the time and is just kind of running around chattering most of the time. And I guess he lives in a house with a big greenhouse attached in the woods. And at this point, he's, oh, he's also a drunk. So at this point, he had gotten into his, his truck and was driving down the road drunk and Thurman ran out in front of him and he hit him. And I'm not really sure why Doc just doesn't get arrested or... They, they can't find him. Somehow they know, like, because they find a, his hubcap or something, they oh, know it was yeah. him. Oh, that was hilarious. He holds up this generic hubcap and says, there's only one man in town who has a truck with hubcaps like this. <laughs> right. It, I'm like, what? It looks like every other truck hubcap. Yeah. And then Bert. I don't know, who's Bert? I don't know. Bert. He's the greenhouse guy. He's no, like, that's Doc Roller, right? No, no, well, Doc has a greenhouse, but Bert is like, uh, he's got kind of a, I don't know if he starts the trees or whatever. He's got a greenhouse that he tends to. He's yeah. another farmer. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, another farmer. He finds after the, okay, so they, they have that meeting that we already talked about, and then he takes Tom out to his trunk, and he's like, look, I found this big rock. Oh, I have never seen anything like this, my friend. Never. What do you say we pull her out of here and take over to Thurman's warehouse so I can run some tests on it and get a little better look at it? Sure, whatever you want to do. You think it looks like a meteorite? Yes, sir, I sure do. I sure do. And even better than that, you see the sediment that she's stuck in here. I can pull this and do a carbon date on it. Yeah. Then I'll be able to tell when she fell to Earth. If it was about four or five hundred years ago. You may have the rock in the pictograph there, my friend. This might be the Comet Valley meteorite. So what does he do? He takes it to Kim, the little girl, and she's, like, cleaning it up. And she's like, it looks like a giant peach pit. And yes, yes, it does. That's exactly what it looks like. This is supposed to be their bonding moment, I think. They've, they're in the garage. Real scientific location. They're in the garage. And he and her and Heidi are all three there. It seems like they're trying to give the impression that he's trying to win Heidi over by being nice to Kim. I guess. I guess and give her uh -huh. things to do. We're going to see more of these seeds, which look like giant peach pits later. Doc's got a whole bunch of them. 
um, in his area. Right. Well, and somewhere in there, Tom sees Mrs. Santiago as a seed person, but like isn't particularly concerned about yes. it. What was that? <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> like he like. Like, she, I think, is in his room, like, snooping around, and the door is locked, and so, like, he's fumbling with the door, and then when he opens up the door, there's, like, this eight-foot-tall monster that, like, lunges at him, and he falls over backwards, but then Mrs. Santiago comes out, and Heidi's like, what's going on? He's like, I don't know, that was really weird. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. There was something in there. (laughs) So strange. Oh, well. And then he just keeps going on. This is his investigation time, right? He goes to... He goes to Doc's. Well, he goes to Bert, first of all, and he talks to him. And uh, Bert says, you know, Doc, people say he's crazy, but actually he's pretty smart. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, maybe I can go to Doc's. So then he goes to Doc's and pokes around and he sees a couple of these seeds and... I don't know, he cuts one open or one is open and there's gooey stuff inside moving around. Mm-hmm. Like it looks like worms, like big. It was weird. Yeah, it was gross. Um, and I didn't really get it. Like I didn't really understand. I didn't because then he opens up um, like Doc's like journal or science notes or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and on one page it says, "Today I did it, sprouts." And so he thinks that Doc is trying to. I don't know, sprout these seeds, I guess. Um, but then later, when he confronts Doc about it, it's like, no, he's like, I'm not trying to do that. You know, you saw all those seeds in water. That wasn't water. Those That was like um, herbicide or, or something. Mm. And I never really got it because on the one hand, it seems like Doc knows that these things are dangerous and he's trying to stop the spread, but then on the other hand, he's also, like, scientifically curious and wants to know how they work. Yeah. It's a mess. There is a mess. I mean, a little bit later in the movie when we get kind of to the climax and they're going to go after and they're going to kill all these, he has kind of a little throwaway bit where he runs up to... Uh, Tom and it's like can't we just keep one seed can't we just keep one just for scientific experiments and Tom's like are you mad and that's sort of the end of that yeah there's no real intrigue there where some you know it's not an alien situation where somebody's trying to sneak away something for for their own benefit at one point Doc goes and visits Tom in his garage and he's acting all crazy and holds a gun up to him they have kind of a lame fight slash standoff and then the sheriff pulls up for no good reason and comes out, and Tom walks up to him and says, "Ah, oh, I found Doc." And the sheriff's like, "Get out of my way! I'm going to handle this from now on." Just antagonistic for no reason at all. And then goes in and has another super lame, like prowling around, aiming his gun around the door, trying to find Doc thing. I think at some point in here, Doc says a poem too, which I guess is supposed to be sinister, but just comes across really silly. Yeah, I, I forgot there was a poem. <laughs> there was a poem. Well, I suppose you don't know that what you are examining is not mineral. So why don't you tell me what it is then, Doc? This was the goal of the leaf and the root. This little grain is the ultimate fruit. For this did the blossom burn its hour. This is the awesome vessel of power. <laughs> I, I do know at one point he very ominously says, plants are the most cunning and savage of all life forms. <laughs> and and the, and Tom's like, what are you talking about? They can't even move. And he's like, well, maybe they can't, but seeds can. Seeds are chasing us. I don't even understand what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> like I are are these are these seed like okay so these monsters are the monsters themselves seeds? Well, I don't I, think, I don't I think he's sort of predicated on the idea and he says this too that seeds are extremely durable like you can freeze them, you can like, you know, keep them for for thousands of years somewhere and then they'll still sprout under the right conditions, you can send them into space. He's basically saying these seeds from space are not to be messed with. They could be anything. They could be thousands of years old. We don't know where they're from, but those seeds themselves are super, super durable. And that's why, you know, that's why they're so scary, I get. The seeds are. I don't think the creatures that come from them seem all that durable at all. Well, but 
Tom says to the um, FBI guy at some point, he, he's like, did I get them all? Did I get them all? And the guy's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. Everything's fine. And he's like, no, you don't understand. You can't just shoot a seed. You have to hack it into a million pieces. Hmm. And, and then later, like – or earlier or whatever in the timeline. I don't know. It jumps back and forth because it's all flashback. At some point at the end when there's, like, the big confrontation showdown, he does. He, like, takes a hatchet and, like, he's, like, tearing up these seed people. So I don't – and it is called seed people. So yeah. I think the monsters are supposed to be seeds, but I don't know what they're trying to grow. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I – I don't know. I don't get it. Um, there's a scene where um, – the girl Kim sees people looking around out in the orchard with flashlights at night. So she takes the video camera out there, and it's a whole bunch of people. And one of them's her dad, and at some point, like one of the seed things rolls at her, and she videotapes that. And another one flies over her head, like just in this one moment, they can fly mm. to. I I don't yeah. get that. But then she sees her dad like standing right in front of her, and he's like, "Come to daddy," and she's like, "You're." my daddy (laughs) and then she points the camera at him and in this really really lo-fi camera view we see him transform and it was so obvious that they had to do it through this lo-fi lens just because the special effects work was so low budget yeah, um, and that's the only time we ever actually see anybody transform. Usually, it's just somebody from off screen like tosses one of those things at somebody, or yeah. they're rolling around on the <laughs> yeah. ground, and or... then they wrestle with it as though the laws of gravity no longer apply, and you know, <laughs> like, right? <laughs> you can't just throw it off of you. We had this problem too with another Charles Band production. I think it was uh, Puppet Master. Maybe I don't know. This is the point at which you know we realize the uh, pretty much the whole town apparently now except for these few people, have been transformed into seed people. And they're walking around more or less like zombies in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And there's this giant seed with little seedlets, I guess, coming up. Uh-huh, that they're digging up. That right. they're digging up. So I guess the idea is this is this is the big meteorite that the town is known for, uh, that they've all just suddenly dug up. So it's right there. It's just... It's like an, I don't think it was dug up. It's a mound. It's like not just an inch or two below the surface, but it's (laughs) it's so obvious. It it was right by the road. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's huge. Right. It's like the size of a camper. Yeah. The movie doesn't even make any sense to me. Okay. So Frank got spooged on and then that other guy got covered in corn pops but then, like, Frank can just kind of hypnotize Heidi and Kim into being seed people. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they are for a while. And yeah, they're... He stares at them or something. Uh, and, like, reaches out one of his seed people arms. And then all of a sudden they are seed people, too. But at some point, I don't know, like, so Tom is still normal. And he's running around with the, Doc, the I guess. Yeah, and Doc. And in some in some points the seed people are like chasing after them and trying to attack them and then in another part i feel like doc and tom are standing i don't know like in a garage or something and heidi and frank show up in a truck and like start loading or unloading a truck or something and frank's like they can't even see us and doc's like yeah they can see us we just are inconsequential like, since when? Like, they've been chasing you for the whole rest of the movie, and now they just don't care? Uh. But then they do care, because then they go into the shed, and they run at them, and they kind of duck out of the way, and they fall against a table, and there's an ultraviolet light that's swinging overhead, because they're in a grow room. I don't... None of this makes sense to me, because ultraviolet... <laughs> God. All right, so we were introduced the ultraviolet light thing in the greenhouse where Bert worked. He apparently has all these ultraviolet lights strung up over the plants. Now, I don't know if you know anything about ultraviolet light, but pure ultraviolet light is going to kill plants. Right. I know this because we turn on ultraviolet lights here at the school where I work. We actually have them installed in the room so that like once or twice a week, it sort of sanitizes the room and everybody's got to take the plants out before we turn that on. So they do have a negative effect on plants. 
And that is ultimately the crutch that they find. The swinging ultraviolet light swings back and forth. They fall against this table, and suddenly they, they're staring up at it, and they look, and Doc and Tom look at each other, and they're like, it must be the ultraviolet light. And suddenly these two are back to normal again. Uh-huh. They're fine. There's no transformation. There's no whatever. It just, like, um, purified, I guess. So I guess it it did kill the plants. Now, Doc himself has been stringing himself up with ultraviolet lights this whole time. So you get the impression that he knows, that he already knows their weakness, that he's discovered it. But here, it's like he's rediscovering it for the second time or getting proof that it works. I, I don't know. Then they go to Bert. Bert is in a greenhouse, and that, and he has tons of ultraviolet lights there, and so they, you know, are take, they, they enlist him to take all that stuff down. They're going to make a big trap for these seed people. Why does Bert's greenhouse have so many ultraviolet lights installed in there? I don't know. If they kill plants, maybe there's something I don't understand. I mean, grow lights are different, right? They, they like, mimic the sun. Right. But what he, we're talking about here is ultraviolet lights, which would kill the plants, and it's going to kill the seed people. So anyway, it doesn't make sense to me. But Bert's easy to convince about this whole scheme with about a few sentences. Oh, there are seed people invading? Okay, I knew something funny was going on. Uh, and they grab up all the lights, and then they go and they make, uh, essentially, gosh, it was like Return of the Living Dead 2, right? Where they make um, kind of a tunnel. Yeah. Except in, I think, Return of the Living Dead 2, they were they were rigging up with electricity. Yeah. This is almost no different, because they rig up this kind of frame over the road with all these ultraviolet lights in it, and they <laughs> have a really long extension cord to plug it into this power thing that is continuously and constantly sparking. Well, yeah, and <laughs> like, they set up... It's like a frame, is what it looks like, yeah. of these ultraviolet lights. And, and I think it's Brad and Heidi, I think. The seed people still think that Brad and Heidi are seed people, so they can infiltrate, and they, like, are driving the truck that they've loaded... The seed people have loaded all these pods into yeah they kind of pretend to be them again don't they uh -huh. but, but that surprised me because i didn't see a scene in between all of a sudden i saw the two of them driving a truck all of a sudden and i thought how did they get back there yeah i don't know they just went back i guess and so i get they think that the seed people God, are going to are going to lead them right by this power plant or whatever it is. They call it the substation, I think. They think that they're going to lead them right by there, but at the last minute, the seed people like try to divert them away. So they have to blow their cover and drive the truck really fast towards this substation. And they get there, but the seed people are like attacking them, and so they very haphazardly go into this light tunnel and like they crash it up a, a good yeah. part of it and i'm thinking there's no way this is gonna work now but apparently also in crashing it like they moved it just enough so that the extension cord won't reach i, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I have this i have this problem in my living room all the time by the way <laughs> <laughs> and it's 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 right out of and okay, so every, you know everything's going crazy. The the seed people are fighting the not seed people, and Doc meanwhile has these two ends of the cord, and it's not even like in its extension cord. It's like the wire has been severed, so he's got two live wires, and he can't get them together. So the way that I viewed what happened, and tell me if I'm wrong here. Didn't he, like, use himself to close the circuit? Yeah. So, the idea was he was being electrocuted through the, yeah, to close the circuit. Right. So then all the lights come on, and all of the seed people are cured, except for Mrs. Santiago, apparently, for reasons unexplained. I guess the light didn't touch her or something. And so she jumps in the car and starts driving off. And then Tom is in the back of the truck trying to stop her, but a big monster attacks him. And that's when he falls and hits his head. Now, he, remember that he's telling this story. So I don't know how he knows what happens after he fell and hit his head and was unconscious. <laughs> there are a lot of these moments where there's no way he knew what happened, yeah. <laughs> he's narrating some scene he was never there for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so after he gets knocked out, apparently Mrs. Santiago, I don't remember why, drives off a cliff 
and the yes. the truck explodes <laughs> yeah. as they always do when you drive off yeah. a cliff. That once again, this could have been a really and they were trying so hard. They were trying so hard to make this a, a thrilling action scene and all the pieces were there with his truck driving by and him in the back and him almost falling out and he does fall out. I mean, there's stunt work and stuff. But you can't help but notice that even though this truck is supposed to be going, I don't know, 40, 50 miles an hour, it's not blowing their hair around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it just looks so much like a truck just being shaken uh-huh. in a dark room, you know, with just enough lighting uh, to see what's going on. Uh, so low rent. <laughs> mm-hmm. So low budget, uh, which is a, it's a bit of a shame. It just, like I said, that's how I feel about the whole movie. Well, there's a touch at the end, right? So he finishes telling the story to the doctor and to this G-man or whatever. They basically say, thank you, thank you very much for the story. And the G-man turns to the doctor and says, okay, like, you can finish it or whatever. Well, the and, and the, the FBI guy has been shady the whole movie. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he just, every single time we cut back, he's like, oh, that's, that's an interesting part of your story. What about Doc? What about Doc? What happened to him? What happened to him? Like, he has just been asking the whole time. And finally, at the end, the guy, I don't know why he couldn't have just told him this from the beginning, but at the very end, he, I guess he says, well, he's dead because he got electrocuted or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, then the guy's like, oh, okay, well, thanks. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Thank you for taking an hour to tell me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I didn't think about it that way, actually. <laughs> Didn't you? I mean, you saw this coming a million miles oh, away. Oh yeah, right? I saw like, this part. Yeah. Ten minutes into the movie, you knew what was going to happen at the end. Yeah. So the FBI guy's like, "Don't worry, everything's cool. Heidi and Kim are just in the other room." And he's like, "Okay, well, I'll bring them in." And and Heidi comes in, and you can tell just by the way that she's acting that she's a seed person. Everything's fine. Doc Roller is dead. Then we don't have anyone else to worry about, do we? Not anymore. <laughs> the end. Like, <laughs> yep. I'm gonna take over the world now. Once they get across that bridge to the rest of the, yeah. the world, <laughs> they open up that bridge. It's over. Gosh, yeah. I don't know. Here, uh, there is a good thing about this movie, and that is it is short. <laughs> yes. A nice, tight hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, not even. It says, I think on IMDb, it says it's like an hour and 27 minutes or something like that. And then when I pulled up the file, it was only 121. And it, the movie was really over by 115. Yeah. It was just there. W- then there were credits, and then there was you know the full moon like preview uh, after that. So the movie really is not more than an hour and fifteen minutes long. And thank goodness because it felt like days long. <laughs> 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 no, yeah. that's that's an exaggeration. It didn't really feel that long. It just wasn't good. Like yeah. I was looking forward to watching something fun and goofy and. It's it's not like I was self-harming to get myself through it or anything. I mean, it was fine. We've seen worse. Um, it was just kind of a disappointment. I was I was looking for something a little bit more fun. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. Is it, it just took itself so seriously. It was just so inept that you're not in on any joke. <laughs> I mean, it's it, if it is a throwback to these 50s movies, it doesn't play like one. You know, it doesn't play like a parody or a loving homage or anything. It just kind of plays like a lame ripoff. Yeah. And the production value is so low. And we've seen lower. I mean, we really have, but it's so laughable at points, but not in a particularly fun way. Because what's going on is just kind of low stakes. I mean, we never really get terribly invested in these characters. We don't really care too much about what happens to them. They don't even seem like real people. Uh, everything's really contrived. It's hard to even follow this little investigation. or, You know, part of it, I guess, is that the movie kind of comes in when everything's already happening. Or happened. Yeah. Usually with a movie like this, you know, there's some build, right? You see a comet. Well, oh, what was that? And you've got the first guy who discovers it, right? And And so you see it kind of, dare I say, sprout <laughs> in the mm. beginning and grow 
out. But here it's like the maid's already got it. From the very beginning, the mm -hmm. maid's got it. You don't know how she got it. Maybe this is a good one. Maybe it's a good movie for our times, you know? You don't know how this stuff spreads. You just wake up one day and suddenly everybody's got it. <laughs> but it starts the movie there. <laughs> yeah. You know? So there's not even that kind of build. Yeah. By the time you realize there's something sinister going on, it's kind of already almost done. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the director... Okay, so Charles Band gets a writing credit just for having the idea. Um, and then it was written by... The screenplay was written by a guy named Jackson Barr. I didn't really look into him. But the, the director, um, Peter Manugian, I looked at his um, credits, and he directed Demonic Toys for Full mm -hmm. Moon. And I haven't seen that movie since I was a kid, but I remember thinking that movie was fun mm. and funny when I was young. So we may have to revisit that at some point because I remember, I remember it being darkly comedic and kind of crass. I mean, I was little when I saw it, but yeah. I had looked him up before I watched the movie. I'm like, oh, he did Demonic Toys. Cool. Like, that was kind of a fun movie. And this this just wasn't... I mean, and that's fine. You know, especially with Full Moon, you, you know it's going to be hit or miss. Um, and even the hits are not, like, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> they can just kind of be fun diversions uh, every once in a while. Um, so for what it is, fine, okay. You know, it, it felt very much like something that you would catch really late at night on cable back in the day. Yeah, kind of feels like drive or drive-in fare, um, just yeah. not a great example of it. It's an artifact from an era, and I think we talked about this too when we talked about David Dakota and his output. And and that was there was a time in the early to mid '80s where you could just make a genre movie and sell it to the home video market. All you needed was some money and a script and a, the resources to put something together. It didn't matter if it was good or bad; it was gonna sell. And so they were full moon, basically full moon. Roger Corman became that. Everything David Decoteau did, you know, one of my favorite guys, uh, Jim Wynorski. All these guys were just in this trauma. We're just going to churn out as much as we can. It doesn't matter if it's that great. We'll just use the money we get. We know it's going to sell. And uh, and that's what the, that's this is the kind of movie you get out of that. Sometimes, like you said, sometimes there's something just quirky and it just really works. Most of the time, it's like this. <laughs> yeah, but and but this movie feels like it was late to the party. Like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's difficult for me to believe that this was made in 1992. It seems like something that should have been made in 1982. Or, yeah, or, you know, like. I don't know. I mean, it, it maybe this was the tail end of the era and it was kind of petering out, but this wasn't the bang it should have gone out on if that's the case. <laughs> but whatever. I I mean I, I love watching obscure things that I've never heard of before and for that reason alone, um I'm glad that Mikey uh recommended it and it was it was frankly a lot more fun to talk about than it was to watch. Yeah, that's true. And thank you, Mikey, again for your uh, request. We really appreciate it. And if any of the rest of you have any requests, you can just uh, look us up, Two Guys in a Chainsaw, or anywhere online. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. We have a website. Just leave us a comment any one of those places. We are plowing through a bunch of requests right now, so it's not too late to send us yours. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do share it with a friend and help us increase our listenership. Until next time, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With Two Guys in a Chainsaw. 